This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Joel. I got to know Professor Joel through my research. I knew his works before I knew the man in person. Joel's and Oliver, those of you who relate to that sort of law, it's a publication which came out a few years ago. And um, his particular interest, uh, my particular interest in the book, because it was a series of writings, was with regards to the rule of law. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Nesrim, Richard Nesrim, who was once my supervisor together with Professor Helen Zantaki. They did a splendid job in coaching me with patience and understanding, for which I appreciate, express my appreciation. Ambassador, High Commissioner of Formulator, Honorable Justin Whiteman is here. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> of course, my wife and Andy Trotman Joseph is here with me to give me support which I need. <laughs> now it's really an honor and privilege for me to, to be given the opportunity to deliver this evening's lecture. It is especially so as I am once more at my alma mater, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. This opportunity has been afforded me by the Institute Directors and the Dean of the School of Advanced Study of the University of London. In June of 2013, I, was readily, I readily confirmed my acceptance of the nomination to, to award me with the S.T. Lee Visiting Professorial Fellowship for 2013 <coughs> 2014. For me, it is a distinguished honor of rare vintage. And I sincerely mean it, as I know I'll be given a lot of experience, a lot of exposure with regards to the public lectures that I will be giving. I express profound appreciation to my main supervisor, Helen Zantaki, of course I mentioned already Mr. Richard Nesrin, who co-supervised with Professor Zantaki. I also remember the words of Professor Avram Sher of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies when he always, when he mentioned that every day you must make sure that you write at least one paragraph a day in doing your thesis. I remember those words very clear, <coughs> and I stuck to those words. Now today's lecture is entitled Constitutionalism as a, as a Democrat's Dream, the Grenada Experience. And it is the first, as Professor Zeros has said, of the UK series of lectures to be done. Now all these lectures emanate from the my main thesis, in which I defended in 2012, which was entitled, A Critical Analysis of a Post-Revolution Adjudication Dilemma, The Choice and Application of the Doctrine of Necessity in the Grenada Case of Mitchell and the DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions. Now what I intend to do this evening is to have a little conversation with you with regards to constitutionalism. I'll, I'll try to explain what is constitutionalism and the nature of constitutionalism. I'll give a historical account of constitutionalism in Grenada. I'll outline how the Democrats' dream was dashed to pieces when a coup d'etat was staged. 1979, 
and then they'll deal with the question of the concept of legitimacy of a, usur of a usurper regime. The concept of legitimacy is most important, especially these days when you have a lot of revolutionary disobedience in, in the Ukraine, in Venezuela, in Thailand, and you had a lot of that also in the Arab countries, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and presently Syria. You have a civil war in, C in Syria. So the question of legitimacy would be quite relevant to those uh, to what I'm going to speak to you about with regards to legitimacy. Now, what is constitutionalism? And I would say, following the direction of one Will Waluchow, who was, or uh, is still perhaps, a professor at McMaster University in Canada, and his definition is that constitutionalism embraces the principle that government can and ought to be legally limited in its powers and that, it is, and that its authority depends on its commitment to these limitations. I'll, I'll repeat that because it's very important. Constitutionalism embraces the principle that government can and ought to be legally limited in its powers and that its authority depends on its commitment to these limitations. Now, the mere fact that a country has a constitution does not necessarily say that that country abides by constitutionalism or the main principles of constitutionalism. Constitutionalism could be could be um, followed by stages. A country may be given a two, out of a, a range of one to ten, a country may be given two points or two marks. Another one may be given eight marks, dependent on how deep that country utilizes the key principles, the key characteristics of constitutionalism. And I would say that the key characteristics of constitutionalism are the doctrine of separation of powers, independence of the judiciary, and obedience to the rule of law. Now what do we mean by the doctrine of separation of powers? When we speak about the doctrine of separation of powers, We are thinking in terms of what Vile has to say. It is to prevent the abuse of power so that the rights and liberties of citizens will not be compromised or jeopardized in any way. The doctrine of separation of powers plays a most important role in the maintenance of constitutionalism. It is a constitutional principle which asserts that the functions, <coughs> personnel, and powers of the major institutions of the state should not be concentrated into one body. Special provisions in constitutions, therefore, whether written, as in the United States of America, or unwritten, as in the United Kingdom, make allowances for the implementation of the doctrine of separation of powers. The unwritten constitution in the UK evolved over hundreds of years, and its basic tenets are generally supported by certain conventions which also evolve over time. Now, in accordance with the doctrine of separation of powers, constitutions usually specify the limits to be placed on the major pillars of government, that is the legislature, which makes the laws, the executive, which implements the laws, and the judiciary, which adjudicates on legal issues before the courts. Now, why is the constitution of a state consists of a body of laws that establishes and regulates how a state should be governed, 
and it is generally regarded as the supreme law of the state in the United Kingdom. Parliament is regarded as supreme, but this too is questionable because when once the United Kingdom joined the European Union a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, there's a question mark with regards to which, which parliament is supreme. Is it the European Parliament or is it the British Parliament? Because quite a number of things that the British Parliament can do can be superseded to a large extent by the European Parliament. Now, in the, in the United Kingdom, with its unwritten constitution, limits to the state's authority are identifiable, not only in certain written instruments like the Magna Carta, the Petition of Rights, and the Bill of Rights of 1689, but also by case decisions. The case of Entick and Carrington established the limit of executive power in English law. In that case, Lord Camden, the Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, made it very clear that an officer of the state could only act lawfully in a manner which is prescribed either by statute or common law. Recently, that's in 2005, there was a passage of the Constitutional Reform Act in the United Kingdom, and this gives further credence to the doctrine. It is no longer the case that the Lord Chancellor would straddle the legislature, the executive, and at the same time be head of the judiciary. And this was a constitutional anomaly which existed for centuries. It has only changed in 2005. Now, who is here as an expert on the doctrine of separation of powers, recognizes that Western institutional theorists have concerned themselves with the problem of, uh, of ensuring that the exercise of governmental power, which is essential to the realization of the values of the society, should be controlled in order that it should not itself be destructive of the values it was intended to promote. He further states that, of the theories of government which have attempted to provide a solution to this dilemma, the doctrine of separation of powers has in modern times been the most significant. Now, within that doctrine, we have the independence of the judiciary. Now, this concept refers to the situation where judges, in conducting their deliberations on certain legal issues, must be free from being unduly influenced by extraneous factors. And these factors may involve political pressure, from either the legislature, executive, or otherwise. Lack of security of tenure, inadequate remuneration, or personal bias as a result of, it, of extraneous circumstances. So it is quite important, very important, to ensure that there is independence of the judiciary. And you can have overall independence as institutional ind independence as well as individual in the independence of the judiciary. Now, the other characteristic that I spoke about is with regards to the rule of law. And there is a sort of confu not confusion schools of thought, two main schools of thought with regards to what is really the rule of law. Because there is a formal conception of the rule of law and there is the substantive conception of the rule of law. The formal conception of the rule of law holds the view that the law must be prospective, well known, with characteristics of generality, equality and certainty. This view contains no requirement about the content of the law and makes no distinction between good laws and bad laws. On the other hand, the substantive conception of the rule of law goes beyond this approach and holds that the rule of law intrinsically protects some or all individual's rights and freedoms and unlike the formal conception, distinguishes between good laws and bad laws adopting the principle that bad laws are outside the scope of the rule of law. 
Now, by the writings, theories who have been associated with the formal <coughs> conception of the rule of law, and Dicey, Joseph Raz, H. L. E. Hart, among others, of course, and those who have been associated with the substantive conception, Dorking, Rawls, and Laws. We have Professor Joel here. I think he's taking a middle route. <laughs> Take the middle ground between the formal conception and the substantive conception. I hope I've, I've gotten him correctly. Yeah. Because he, he considers that the rule of law contains a number of important, and I'm quoting, the rule of law contains a number of important values, including legality, certainty, <coughs> accountability, efficiency, due process, and access to justice. The, these are not only formal values, but also substantive. If I'm wrong, you'll correct me. <laughs> yes. Well <laughs> said. And uh, Raz came up with a number of principles with regards to his views on the formal con conception. And also John Rawls came up with his. As a matter of fact, John Rawls in 1999 publication said, the rule of law is obviously closely related to liberty. We can see this by considering the notion of a legal system and its intimate connection with the precepts definitive of justice as regularity. Now it seems to me that generally <coughs> philosophers and world bodies look to more towards the substantive conception of the rule of law. You have the International Commission of Jurists, the International Bar Association and other such institutions. They look towards more at the substantive principle with regards to the rule of law. So constitutionalism embraces these three key characteristics and Venkat Aye has this to say about constitutionalism. He says, constitutionalism has been seen as indispensable to democracies in the modern world. It is usually regarded as a glue which holds a liberal political order together and enables societies based on the rule of law to withstand the shocks that political upheavals inflict on them from time to time. So we can assert now that constitutionalism is a Democrat's dream. It's the glue which holds a, a democracy together. Now Grenada is a small island in the Caribbean which got its independence on the 7th of February 1974. Grenada had its own constitution and the constitution gave impetus to constitutionalism. Adequate measures were put in place with regards to separation of the doctrine of separation of powers, independence of the judiciary, and the rule of law. But as time went on after independence was granted on the 7th of February 1974, the Democrats' dream seem to have turned into a nightmare. On the 13th of March, 1979, the New Jewel Movement, which is a political party, which was a political party in Grenada, in opposition to the then ruling Grenada United Labour Party, staged a coup d'etat whilst Prime Minister Eric Gehry was abroad. And soon after, the late Morris Bishop, as leader of the usurping party, broadcast the declaration of the Grenada Independence <coughs> Grenada Revolution. He declared himself to be the Prime Minister. And the reasons that were stated for the coup d'etat was that it was done as a consequence of the violations and abuses of democracy committed by that government, committed by that administration under the guise 
of constitutional constitutionality. And so they declared that the revolutionary government was then said to be important to issue such laws, orders, rules, and regulations, and to do all things that may be deemed necessary for the restoration and preservation of the peace, order, and good government of Grenada. The revolutionaries then pledged to return to constitutional rule at an early opportunity after a new constitution has been approved by popular support and pledged to observe the fundamental rights and freedoms of the Grenadian people. So they dissolved parliament. The ministers of the then government were locked out of their offices and the usurpers assumed legislative and executive powers of the state. They then suspended the Grenada Constitution, but allowed that all other existing laws shall continue in force. And paradoxically, the Governor General, who was then Sir Paul Schoon, was left as Governor General of the state, representing the Queen. Now, the PRG ruled Grenada for four and a half years from the 13th of March 1979 to October 19, 1983. On the latter date, there was an internal conflict among themselves and Prime Minister Maurice Bishop and several other cabinet ministers and civilians were killed. So later discovered that they were summarily executed by a group of other counter-revolutionaries called the Revolutionary Military Council. That was on the 20, uh, that was on the 19th of October. Now on the 25th of October of the same year, military forces from the United States and the Caribbean staged a military intervention and routed the members and supporters of the RMC and the defendants. And 19 people were arrested and became defendants in the case of Mitchell and the GPP. Following this, the Governor General as head of state took control of the state with a view to restoring law and order and issued a number of proclamations and in two and in fact exercised legislative and executive powers on the state. The defendants 19 of them were committed by a magistrate to stand trial for the offense of murder of Morris Bishop and others before the High Court of Grenada, which, which court was the unconstitutional court. Because during the period of the reign, during the reign of the PRG, that's the People's Revolutionary Government, they got rid of the constitutional court because Grenada was part of a regional court system which was a constitutional court. It was entrenched in the Grenada Constitution. And they established their own court by People's Laws Numbers 4 and 14, which was called the Grenada High Court and the Grenada Appeal Court. And they also, by People's Law Number 84, debarred appeals to be made to the Privy Council. Hitherto, Grenada was allowed to do final appeals at the Privy Council. <coughs> now following lengthy arguments in the High Court, because the ironical thing is that the defendants put in a pretrial motion challenging the validity of the Revolutionary Court. They say it was unconstitutional, so it was therefore invalid and incompetent to try them for murder. The matter was heard before Chief Justice Ned in the High Court, at the Grenada High Court, which is a revolutionary court. And the Chief Justice opined that although the Revolutionary Court was unconstitutional, the court had the validity and competence to try the defendants 
based upon the doctrine of necessity. Now at this point I must inform you that just 10 days before the del delivery of the decision in the High Court, the Governor General promulgated the Constitution of Grenada Order 1984, which was published in the official Gazette on 9th November 1984. And basically it outlined that the 1973 Constitution was duly enforced, save and except certain provisions which were therein specified. A general election was held on 3rd December 1984 for the first time since the 1979 coup and in effect brought back constitutional government to Grenada. And the first piece of legislation that the constitutional government passed was Act No. 1 of 1985 in order to confirm the validity of laws made during the period March 1979 and November 1984. That's the, the period that the PRG was there and part of the period that the Governor General was there. So you see what is happening here. You have a constitutional system in place, yet the matter that is being tried is an unconstitutional court. So, on the surface, it seems that the defendants had good ground for claiming that the court was unconstitutional and as a consequence of this, it had no validity and competence to try them. So, the Court of Appeal was asked to make judgment on the situation because the High Court ruled already under Chief Justice Ned. So the judges in the Court of Appeal really had a dilemma. Because it's the first time in the Caribbean that you had an extra, extra constitutional situation such as we had in Grenada. And so they couldn't rely on any precedent set in any of the courts in the Caribbean. And as the president said, they couldn't even rely on precedents of, the, of English law. Because although you had two revolutions in England, you had the glorious revolution of 1688, and the revolution in 1642, when King, James, King Charles I was eventually executed. But the president of the court, President Haynes, couldn't identify any precedents to assist him with regards to making a determination on the challenge which was made by the defendants. So he said, we must, with the assistance of counsel, satisfy ourselves that the other precedents which are set in the Commonwealth now are right. We just cannot pick them up like that to try to resolve our own situation here in Grenada. We can't find any English law. We have to look at some of the books, established books like Blackstone and books of that nature. And we have to look at Commonwealth cases. And although when you look at Commonwealth cases, they cannot be firm with regards to how you make your resolution, but they can guide you with regards to certain principles. And when the president of the court analyzed the situation, he realized that there were four <coughs> concepts, four doctrinal concepts that courts used in days gone by with respect to trying to find a resolution to extra constitutional issues. And these four concepts were the principle of strict constitutionalism, Professor Kelsen's general theory of, of law, the doctrine of necessity based mainly on the classical maxim salus populi est suprema lex, as the safety of the state is the supreme law, 
and the fourth, the concept of the political sovereignty of the people in a democratic state, which I refer to as the doctrine of successful revolution. Now the president realized that perhaps one of these doctrinal concepts could assist him with regards to finding a resolution to the challenge that was made by the defendants. Now, with the doctrine of strict constitutionalism, you have to interpret the Constitution by the express words that the Constitution states. So if the Constitution states that the court, that the Constitutional Court is the one which Grenada was part of, that's the regional court, and you try to have the trial in another court, following the doctrine of strict constitutionalism, the defendants would be correct in saying that the court was unconstitutional, incompetent, and invalid to try them. That is if he adopts the doctrine of strict constitutionalism. Another principle that could have been adopted is Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality. Now, Kelsen's theory is a normative theory based on norms and so forth. And it will take me an hour to explain, especially if you don't know what is Kelsen's theory. What is Kelsen's theory? But basically, what it says is that the legal system is a system of norms that goes up like an apex. And when you want to pull out one, the whole thing will crumble. But normally, the norms remain in place. And it is only when you have a coup d'etat or a revolution that you can have a new legal order being formed. That means there is discontinuity in the existing legal order and the new legal order comes into place. That's Kelsen's theory normally. And when you have a new legal order coming into place, any usurper regime that holds control can pass any legal valid laws. So that means if Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality was followed, the PRG, that's the People's Revolutionary Government, could have made valid laws. So if they established a revolutionary court, that court would have been a valid court. So that's another option that the president had. Another option was the doctrine of necessity. And the doctrine of necessity is really constitutionalism in its flexible sense, not in the strict sense which, of which I spoke about a while ago. It's a flexible form of constitutionalism, which makes allowances for certain illegal actions to be deemed valid for a temporary period in certain necessitous situations. So if the court took the view that perhaps the situation was necessary for keeping the revolutionary code there and trying the defendants, then it is based on the doctrine of necessity because circumstances may have warranted that situation. And the fourth principle that was spoken about was the doctrine of necessity, which Haynes referred to as a concept of the politica, political sovereignty of the people in a democratic state. Now, this option may be parallel to what President Hayes refers to as the concept of the political sovereignty of the people in a democratic state, without utilizing all the norms of wrong norm uh, from Kelsen's theory and efficacy and, and so forth. Now, this doctrine has been recognized over the centuries because in the United States of America, became a new state as a result of revolution. France became a new state 
as a result of revolution. And these states became new states even before Kelson's time. They didn't have to depend on Kelson's theory to say that these states became new legal systems. What was said is over a number of years, even though you have a, an illegal takeover of government, a coup d'etat, a revolution, once the bulk of the population <coughs> accept that a new legal system is in place, then you have the doctrine of successful revolution taking effect. Was this a situation in Grenada? Haynes had to ask himself that question. And I would say that both this doctrine, the doctrine of successful revolution, and also Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality, rely on this continuity of the legal order with the formation of a new legal system. Now the legal order is not is not relating to one law or two laws, but to the whole system, as a, the system as a whole. Now hence, consider that if, if he looked, or if he wanted to adopt the doctrine of strict constitutionalism, he would have to set the defendants free, because the defendants would be correct in the sense that they are saying that the court was unconstitutional, invalid and incompetent. With strict constitutionalism, he had no, he had no option but to set the defendants free. Unless perhaps the government can establish a constitutional court because the revolutionary court was unconstitutional. And to establish a constitu constitutional court, they had to rely on section 39 of the constitution, which outlined that to amend the constitution, they had to get two-thirds majority in the House of Representatives, two-thirds majority in the Senate, two-thirds majority by referendum. In the original situation, there was no parliament, no real parliament in place. Parliament only started in 1984. So that was out of the question in those days. And in order to make the Revolutionary Court a constitutional court, they would still have to rely on doing the same thing, Section 39. And in, in those days, the number of other countries which are part of the regional court system, which, which countries belong to the constitutional court, were very reluctant to take back Grenada into the regional court system. Because only the Governor General was there, and perhaps it was thought, and he reflected that, perhaps it was thought that the Governor General was not the right person for them to make any negotiations with, for Grenada to come back into the regional court system. And the President himself said it will take an inordinate amount of time for any constitutional court to be established. And in the meantime, he had to think about Section 8, 8 one of the Constitution, which says that anybody who is charged for murder must be tried within a reasonable time. So they can't just leave the defendants there in the court and without having a specific period for organizing a constitutional court. So to Hayes, the doctrine of strict constitutionalism was not an option, it was not the best option. So he thought about Kelson's theory. And Kelson's theory, as I mentioned earlier on, recognizes, and to my mind, let me tell you this, Kelson's theory and the doctrine of successful re revolution are more or less the same. And I took the position that Kelson realized that the doctrine of successful revolution was used 
over the years, even go before his time, with regards to establishing new legal systems. And he came up with the normative order of things with regards to the same principles which were established to determine new states by the doctrine of successful revolution. Because the similarities are, one, you have a successful revolution, and two, you have a discontinuity in the legal order, and you have a new legal order being formed. The only, there's a difficulty, however, with regards to when does a new legal system come into being. And the judges, God really recognizes this. Because there's no, as you said, there's no neat rule of thumb to indicate when a new, an old system ends and when one begins. H. L. E. Hart also recognizes this in his writings. So, and another thing, for Kelsen's theory to take effect, to get all the key characteristics or key fundamentals in place to rely on Kelsen's theory, you have to determine that the usurper regime was not only governing de facto, but also de jure. And the jury does not rely on international recognition from other states. Other states may say, well, look, we recognize your government, but that alone is not enough. You have to rely on municipal law, local law, in order to determine whether you have a usurper regime that has both de facto and the jury status. And President Hayden said, okay, the PRG was in, was, had a successful revolution, yes, it lasted for four and a half years. But he could not determine <coughs> that there were de facto, the, the jury in place, because he said there was no evidence adduced for him to accept that the government had ju the jury status. You see, he's not denying that perhaps they had, but no evidence was adduced in the court to satisfy him that they had the jury status. And according to both Kelsen's theory and also the doctrine of successful revolution, both the de facto and the jury status are necessary conditions for the utilization of those concepts. So you have to move out from strict constitutionalism, you have to move out from Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality, you have to move out from the doctrine of successful revolution. As I said, the doctrine of successful revolution and Kelsen's theory are more or less based upon the same principles. So he looked, as President Haynes now, he looked at the doctrine of necessity. Now, what did I say about the doctrine of necessity? I said that it accepted that there may be times when you accept illegalities because of necess necessitous situations. Now, what was the situation in Grenada? The PRG took over the government the constitutional government, and I must tell you also that there is confusion with regards to whether the constitutional court pulled out or whether the PRG chased them out. There's confusion. There's no established fact with regards to that. We have someone here who might be able to tell us. <laughs> but. There is no established fact, as far as I know, as to why the Constitutional Court moved away from Grenada. So now, with regards to the doctrine of necessity, as I, I mentioned earlier on, the amount of 
things that the government will have to do to get a constitutional court in place, section 39 and so forth, it'll take an inordinate amount of time and so forth. So President Haynes, he looked at a particular case in Cyprus. There's a case of Attorney General of the Republic of Cyprus versus Ibrahim. And the principles and the facts of the case seem to fall on all fours to the facts of the Grenada case. In Cyprus, the, the 1960 uh, Cyprus Constitution deeply entrenched the rights of the 18% of the Turkish community giving that community the right to participate in important executive, legislative, and judicial matters of state. Article 133.1 provided for a supreme constitutional court consisting of a Greek, a Turk, and a neutral judge as president with two votes. Article 153.1 provided for a high court of justice consisting of two Greek judges, one Turkish judge, with a neutral judge as president with two votes. A complicated system. In 1964, the machinery of government was thrown into a tailspin when the Turkish Cypriots withdrew their participation, which situation left a dysfunctional court system. As a consequence of this phenomenon, the House of Representatives in the month of July, in the absence of its Turkish members, passed a law, number 33 of 1964, which established a new Supreme Court to take over the functions of the former Supreme Constitutional Court. So obviously, this new court was unconstitutional. But they had no options. Because there's confusion between the Greeks and the, and the Turks. The, according to the Constitution, a certain number of Turks have to be there, a certain number of Greeks have to be there. But because of the confusion, they couldn't form a court. And there must be a situation where you have administration of justice taking place. So they formed a new court, which in strict sense was not a constitutional court. So President Haynes looked at that, and he realized that, look, the Cypriots couldn't use the doctrine of strict constitutionalism in that situation because the whole system would collapse and they relied on the doctrine of necessity because of the necessitous nature of the situation and he thought that that case was rightly decided that's his words the case was rightly decided so Relying on the principles of the Abraham case, Abraham case, we decided that although the court, the revolutionary court in Grenada was unconstitutional, because of the necessitous situation in Grenada, the courts would have the validity and the competence to try the defendants based on the doctrine of necessity. That was the, that was the determination of the court. Now, before we, and I must say, to, say, <clears throat> let us deal now with the question of legitimacy of a usurper regime. Because that was a major question for President Haynes to answer. Whether the People's Revolutionary Government had legitimacy. Because if he found that the Revolutionary Government had legitimacy, that means that they would have had the jury status, as I mentioned earlier on. So, what is legitimacy? 
And I would say that legitimacy refers to the recognition and acceptance by a substantial majority of the populace of the authority of a governing regime and the absence of coercion. I'll read that again. <clears throat> legitimacy refers to the recognition and acceptance by a substantial majority of the populace of the authority of a governing regime and the absence of coercion. This recognition and acceptance may be indicated by a way of general election or by referendum. It is postulated that this general definition of legitimacy seems to be in alignment with the modern trend of thinking in common law jurisdiction and also coincides with the principles as established by both Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality and the doctrine of successful revolution. revolution. In determining that whether the PRG had legitimacy or not, President Haynes came up with four principles. Principles of efficacy. A, the revolution was successful in that the government was firmly established administratively, there being no other rival one. B, its rule was effective in that the people by and large were behaving in conformity with and obeying its mandates. Three, each conformity and such conformity and obedience was due to popular acceptance and support or was not mere tacit submission to coercion or fear of force. And he came up with a fourth principle. It must not appear that the regime was oppressive and undemocratic. And Haynes felt that those conditions must exist before a court in a democratic country should pronounce a revolutionary regime legitimate and be identified, and he identified the situation in the cases of Abraham, as I, as I mentioned, and, um, sorry, of Valabaji and the control of customs, and Uganda and con commission of prisons. In those, he felt that those cases established the four principles of legitimacy that he spoke about. Now, in the Valabaji case, this case came about as a result of something that happened in the Seychelles. Balabaji against the control of taxes. Someone, Balabaji challenged the taxes which were, which they were trying to impose on him. And he's saying that the laws which the, the super regime in such else were invalid. So you could not be charged you could not be charged under that law. Now in the such you, you did have a usurper regime. But subsequently there were elections and the people who were involved in the in the usurper regime became elected as parliamentary representatives. So they legitimated whatever took place before. And the principle of that relates to a case in the United States of America, America called Williams and Ruffy. That means the government became legitimated ab initio from the beginning. Even if they started out as an illegal regime, they had elections, people adopted them. So Whatever laws that were passed before, even before the elections, were cons considered to be good laws. Williams and Bruffy. <coughs> now, the Matuba case revealed that a considerable number of affidavits were submitted in the evidence in the case, which were not contradicted, indicating that the usurper regime had full support from the populace. The court applied Kelsen's theory of revolutionary legality. <coughs> And the learned Chief Justice, in delivering the judgment of the court in that case, said, After a perusal of these affidavits, the contents of which have not been in any way challenged or contradicted, we are satisfied and find as a fact that the new constitution has been accepted by the people of Uganda and that it has been firmly established throughout the country. The changes introduced therein, having been implemented without opposition, 
and there is not before us any evidence to the contrary. That means in Uganda you had popular support again, a support from the bulk of the population. Now, according to Haynes in the Mitchell case, and speaking in connection with the Matuba case, he said there was full ample proof that the people had approved and accepted both the revolution or coup d'etat, or whatever it was, and the 1966 constitution, which fact introduced the political doctrine of the sovereignty of the people as a contributory factor to revolutionary legitimacy. Uh, Haynes, so Haynes laid, laid the groundwork for establishing when a government becomes legitimate. But it was challenged. Those principles were challenged. There were two subsequent cases in Lesotho following Haynes' pronouncements. It was a Makatsu versus King Moshushu in 1989 and Makaneti versus Likania in 1993. They were critical of the conditions which President Haynes in the Mitchell case formulated to test the efficacy of a usurper regime. In the Makatsu case, the learned Chief Justice Cullinan, in criticizing and rejecting conditions C and D as formulated by Haynes, Stated, I do not consider that these further conditions, if taken literally, can be reconciled with the facts of history and should be accepted as preconditions for accepting a revolutionary government as legal. The Macanetti case followed, and it was heard in the, the Sotho Court of Appeals four, four years later. It endorsed the judgment of Cullinan in the previous case. Ackerman, Justice Ackerman explained, the degree to which the present government was well established, effective, accepted, and popular amongst the people was not challenged before the High Court, nor was any of the factual findings by the Lunch of just, Justice in this regard challenged on appeal. Now, this, despite these criticisms, the Court of Appeal in the subsequent Prasa case in Fiji, as in 2002, commented that Bakatso is valuable, but we consider that the Chief Justice's formulation of the efficacy test was too narrowly expressed. So the Prasad case came afterwards and criticized the Makatsu case for being too narrow in its interpretation of efficacy. That's the Republic of Fiji and Prasad. The court, therefore, whilst endorsing Haynes' conditions A, B, and C, that's the Prasad case, they endorsed conditions A, B, and C that you mentioned earlier on, but they had reservations for condition D. A, B, and C, as I said, was A, the revolution was successful in that the government was firmly established administratively, there being no other rival one. B, its rule was effective in that the people, by and large, were behaving in conformity with and obeying the mandates. C, such conformity and obedience was due to popular acceptance and support and were not mere tacit submission to coercion of fear force. But they had reserve reservations on D. It must not appear that the regime was oppressive and undemocratic. Now, although Marcoso, the Marcoso case rejected Haynes' condition C, that is popular acceptance and support, as an essential condition in order to confirm legitimacy of a usurper regime, the regime itself which ruled the Sotho following the 1979 coup d'etat lasted for 16 years. 16 years. The court took judicial notice of the notorious fact that the coup had been successful. It therefore seemed rational to assume that the regime had the support of the majority of the populace. The court also held that the 1986 coup d'etat was successful in that interior judicial notice was taken that the revolution had been popular with jubilation in the streets which greeted the new coup, noting that the applicant did not adduce a scintilla of evidence to suggest that there was general air of discontent. 
Now listen to Haynes when he, in the Mitchell case when he said, the revolutionary regime should not be accorded legitimacy by this court unless it is satisfied that on the whole, the regime had the people behind it and with it. Legality should be achieved only if and when the people accept and approve, for in them lies political sovereignty. And the court so finds. This approval they may give up in issue or subsequently. Length of time might or might not be sufficient to infer it. It might be expressed or given tacit approval, but it is that which should give legitimacy to a successful and effective revolutionary regime. The support of a real majority is sufficient. This could be shown by its majority vote at a general election or a referendum, a majority percentage at the polls. So that constitutes legitimacy. So in conclusion, I see an hour is gone. And I hope you understand the main points that have been made. But there are quite a lot of things that I missed out because of the limited time frame, which could have possibly explained a lot of things to you. So there we have it. We spoke about constitutionalism, the nature of constitutionalism involving doctrine of separation of powers, independence of the ju judiciary, the rule of law. The Grenada Constitution had all these things, and it was moving on in a democratic way until the March 13, 1979 coup d'etat, where the Democrats' dream became a nightmare. And then you had the extra constitutional case being involved, creating a dilemma for the judges in the High Court and also in the Supreme, in the Court of Appeal with regards to whether in truth and in fact the court being unconstitutional was valid and incompetent to try the defendant. Now the doctrine or the, the concept of legitimacy has a lot of implications even to the present day revolutionary disobedience that is taking place in several countries like the, the Ukraine. Do we have a, a substantive majority of the people in the Ukraine usurping power? But right now they have had they have had they didn't have a, the opportunity to have a vote with regards to whether or not they have the support of a substantial majority of the people. So if President Hayes was put in that put, uh, position to judge an extra constitutional issue, you may say, well, look, I have no evidence to say that the usurper regime there is legitimate. Look at the situation in, in the Crimea. Apparently, they want to secede from the rest of Ukraine. They have the majority of support in Crimea as a section of the Ukraine. Because most, or, most, or maybe 70% or more, but the people in Crimea have, have a Russian foundation. They speak Russian and everything. But people in the other parts of the country, they want to join Europe. The people in the Crimea want to, want to go to Crimea. The question of legitimacy also comes up there. When would they have a vote? You have a situation in Venezuela. You have the revolutionary disobedience. And the major question that we have to ask is, to what extent the citizens of a state have an obligation to obey the state? And this is this is a topic that I have to deal with in in Belfast when I go there next week. I do not have time to go to that now. You have the situation in Thailand where you have this revolutionary <coughs> disobedience as well. Do the people have a right to demonstrate, to protest? against a constitutionally elected government, to have a coup d'etat. You have civil war in Syria. 
was the situation there with regards to legitimacy. In the Arab world, you had, you had Tunisia changing the, the legal order. You had Libya changing the, the legal order. You had Egypt changing the, the legal order on two occasions. You had the Yemen changing the legal order because there was successful revolution and people had the opportunity to endorse. We consider those situations to be le legitimate. Because the majority of the people supported whatever took place to bring forth a new regime. What did we have in Grenada? We had a successful revolution, yes. They had the opportunity to have a, a general election so that there would be evidence to show that the people supported the revolution. There was no evidence to show in the court that the substantial majority of people supported the PRG. So Haynes was caught between a rock and a hard place. He couldn't determine that the Yusuf regime had legitimacy, that they had the jury status. That is why he had to resort to the doctrine of necessity. So constitutionalism was there, but it became a nightmare when the coup d'etat took place and there was no legitimacy to be established in that situation. Thank you.